Hello, everyone. This is another episode of On.NET, a weekly show where we talk about .NET with the team and guests. And today, our guest is Miguel again. Hi, Miguel. Hi. How's it going, Bertrand? So you're, you're a regular on the show now. Well, now I'm, uh, now I'm part of Microsoft, so, so I better yes. be a regular every week. <laughs> if you if you want to be here every week, I have absolutely nothing against that. You're more than welcome oh, to to show up anytime. I, I'm gonna run out of opinions very quickly. <laughs> um, it's okay. You can you can sit in the back, do your your stuff, and uh, uh, provide us with quotes of uh, wisdom occasionally. Oh, that's, that's fine by you me. Know, most of my wisdom is uh, most of my wisdom comes uh, from uh, Mexican uh, sayings, uh, popular sayings. And uh, and I usually translate them to English. And a couple of years ago, I went back to Mexico. I, I've not been. I left Mexico in 2000. And a couple of years ago, I went back to Mexico, and they said that whenever I talked, I sounded like somebody from 30 years ago. So <laughs> my expressions are frozen in time. And and I guess when I go back home, I sound. I just sound like out of a old movie. An 80s I, movie. That's how they feel. Yeah, I, I totally understand wh where where you're coming from here because it's exactly the same for me. And, oh, really? uh, yeah, when I go back to France, I, I speak like Jean Claude Van Damme. Oh, okay. Um, he, he speaks with a lot of English words, you know, interspersed in the. Oh, that no, no. But what I mean is that my Spanish has been frozen in time. Yeah. Uh, and the express yeah, I, colloquial expressions that you use are it, frozen in time for me since yeah. ago. So now when I go back, people are like, what the? What? what? People don't say that anymore. Yes. Behold. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> that, that sort of stuff. Yeah, I, I, exactly the same. I, I don't know what kids nowadays are, are, are saying in France. So, yeah. Totally I don't same. know what kids are saying these days in the States. <laughs> I feel old. I just can't follow along with the new lingo. Well, that's right. Yeah, I have to say, I don't even know how to use Snapchat. I don't get the point of it. What is what is Snapchat? <laughs> exactly. exactly. We're all farts. All right. Okay. We lost. All right. Our, yeah. Our, we're trying um, to get dot that hip and exciting. <laughs> we were talking like all the crap it uh, dudes. Uh, what's going on? Yeah. <laughs> Okay, so last time we spoke, well, last time we spoke online uh, with people watching, at least. Um, so you were still independent Xamarin, and now you're Microsoft. So what 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 was the biggest change in your life since then? Uh, biggest change? Well, nothing has changed yet. Uh, there, we're still. I'm still in my office. That's my office. With my monkeys back there, uh, drawing for my daughter. Uh, I still report to the same boss. Um, oh, I know, I know. We had to give everybody Microsoft levels, so everybody has a number. Uh, <laughs> a very flat organization. Everybody was a contributor, uh, <clears throat> and now everybody has a number. We love numbers. Yes, yes, you do. And uh, but nothing has changed that much. I mean, technically, we're still operating as a separate entity until. Um, until July 1st. I, I don't know. Apparently, it's too complicated to merge companies, and they need a lot of time to merge us. So, uh, but we're going to keep reporting to Nat, so my boss stays the same. Uh, my team stays the same. Nobody's moving. Um, no, nobody's moving right now. I, I, get, I am still in Boston, although I visited uh, Redmond last week. I saw you there last week, mm -hmm. and, uh, and that was a ton of fun. Uh, you know, I think we had a good time uh, with everybody there, with the team. Um, that was good. It was good. I really enjoyed meeting all the engineers and the, uh, you know, a lot of these guys. Uh, you know, I'm a fan. I've been a fan of those guys for years, right? Uh, <clears throat> so it was good to meet the, my my uh, my younger years heroes, my childhood heroes. Yeah, I I think the feeling is mutual in lots of cases. Uh, I appear completely black. Don't yeah, I? you do. Oh, yeah. interesting. You're black. You're black. Oh no, you... you're black. What okay. is it? You can still hear me, right? And uh, as long as people can see me, girl, everything is fine. Um, OK, so uh, related to that, um, yeah. what is going to change in .NET because of you? <laughs> and I'm, I'm, I'm oh. saying you, the general examining you, not oh. you personally necessary. Well, I think, the, I think that this actually matters a lot to people. 
And, uh, and from that perspective, <clears throat> uh, and I think that it matters a lot, essentially uh, we had a set of, uh, of customers that are using what we've historically called the mobile profile, uh, API surface ways wise. And it's essentially, it's essentially based on, on the .NET 452 API profile. And and uh, and we essentially we give developers everything they want to use that they're already familiar with, and the day that, and the way that we deal with people uh, deploying on very tiny devices like watches and, and phones and TVs and things like that is that we run a linker. So essentially, we take your code and you only pay for the features that you use, right? So if you use a method for maximal realization, well, we'll bring that method and anything it depends on, right? So <clears throat> we've always uh, taken this approach that will ship all the uh, assemblies to developers, and then developers get to choose uh, what they want to use, and then our linker figures out the rest, right? Um, which is a, a slightly different approach than what uh, .NET Core had taken, uh, where .NET Core had essentially tried to split up functionality in these tiny little libraries. And you pay the price by library, uh, as opposed to letting a machine do it. So. Um, and fundamentally, we need to reconcile these two universes, right? Because we want to have, we want the developers to write the code once and be able to run the code either on .NET Core uh, or on mobile or on Unity, right? So the uh, the the outcome of these discussions is essentially <clears throat> is essentially that we're going to uh, .NET Core is now going to evolve towards supporting uh, all of the APIs that developers uh, have come to love and trust from the .NET desktop, right? So you still get to run every code that you write today for .NET Core, but the nice thing is that now there's a roadmap to get everything else, uh, everything else uh, into into the stack. So, um, so I think that is probably the major change: the fact that uh, <clears throat> that Xamarin is kind of now a first-class citizen in this universe, and uh, and also the fact that Unity needed these uh, APIs as well. So it, it became kind of a so it's not just us; it's, it's just a matter of all the major users of .NET today need this higher surface. So, uh, so .NET Core is moving in that direction, which I think is good news for everybody involved. Yeah. So the the idea is to uh, provide a uniform, more uniform experience, no matter what you're targeting, right? That's right. Exactly. But when you're saying that um, everything will become available um, from everywhere, including .NET Core. Uh, what does that mean for um, Windows-specific APIs, for example, such as? Oh, that's right. Well, that's a good point. Uh, well, um, in fact, when we built the mobile uh, the mobile API, we had already done the work to split out the things that were absolutely non-portable, right? So we already had taken those out, and I think that there's an agreement that things that are just not portable to Unix will be removed. Um, so I think it's fair to say that things that are essentially non-portable or incredibly tight to the kernel, uh, to the Windows kernel, will remain uh, outside of the scope of this. And the good news is that that's fairly a fairly limited surface area. There are things like the registry uh, or uh, named uh, some named objects like named UTXs and named uh, you know uh, some of those threat synchronization prop, uh, primitives that work across processes. Right, so I think it's going to be limited the number of things that don't work across multiple platforms. Now, the one thing that we're talking about really is that it's a subset of all of the full .NET framework, right? Uh, it's not going to include WPF. It's not going to include things like uh, the old style DSP.NET. It's not going to include workflow services. These things, right? So it's really talking about the core, the essentials, uh, the things that you could freely use from server to desktop. Things like system, system XML, uh, system core. MS Core Lib, uh, you know, System Net, and those kinds of things. Sure. So I have a list somewhere. If somebody wants, I can give them a list. I, I just, uh, I would need to find it. Yeah, people will probably actually take your word on that. And, uh... <laughs> oh, that's good. Um, okay, so we have some uh, questions for the audience from the audience. Oh, thank you. Uh, Ryan is saying welcome, Miguel, which is thank nice. You. Thank you, thank you, sir. Uh, I'm very curious to hear your thoughts on how rumors of Google potentially adopting Swift for Android and Facebook's recent release of Reason may or may not affect Xamarin's future. Uh, Xamarin's future. Okay. Uh, 
Well, I don't know where to start. The Facebook one is to me the most interesting one because uh, uh, if you followed, uh, if you followed what this is, it's essentially an OCaml implementation. Um, and uh, and if you like OCaml, you will love F# -sharp. <laughs> F# -sharp is uh, it's essentially an OCaml implementation that has been targeted for .NET. So it's uh, so I guess Don Simon will be very happy to know that uh, his pioneer ways of uh, of bringing OCaml to the masses are now widely recognized. So, uh, so you know, of course, I like it uh, in the same way that uh, you know I love F# -sharp. Uh, So that was what. And what was the other part of the question? Uh, Swift and Android. Oh, uh, Swift and Android. Um, I don't know what to say about that. I mean, Swift will run on Android. Um, it already does. Um, I mean, um, I mean, I, I don't think there's much to say. The, eventually, I think they will have bindings for Android. Uh, it's going to take a few years to get that done. Um, you know, it's a lot of uh, thankless work. So, I mean, you can definitely use Swift today to write uh, UI-less applications or perhaps OpenGL applications. So maybe there will be some of that. But uh, I think that for Swift to be successful outside of, uh, of the Apple platform, we, we got to wait for IDEs to be made available, for an ecosystem to develop that goes beyond the native uh, the native stack. So I think it's an interesting space to watch. Um, I mean, it's definitely an interesting language. I like the language, um, but uh, but you know, I don't know that it has any effect on us. Uh, I mean, us when I'm speaking, Xamarin and the .NET team, right? We are committed to C Sharp. What we're doing is we're putting C Sharp everywhere, <laughs> right? Uh, so now we we pretty much have put .NET on every imaginable device uh, that 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 is in use today, right? From uh, from from every kind of server combination with every possible architecture to uh, embedded systems to mobile systems to desktop computers, mm -hmm. and uh, and that's what we're doing, right? Uh, I mean, I'm I'm glad that other people are experimenting with other things, but our our expertise is really on making .NET shine and. And that's what we're doing, right? So there's fascinating efforts happening in the language space with uh, Mads and his team improving uh, C sharp, Don Syme on F sharp, uh, the .NET team. Uh, in fact, I think that you should sometimes uh, bring. I don't know if you had Mayoni here on, on your on your show, yeah. but uh, but she's the GC lead at uh, at Microsoft, and 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 Patrick Dussoud. I mean. Amazing, uh, amazing work that they're doing on garbage collection and, and memory management. That's a great idea. Oh yeah, no, it's amazing. I mean, we had a great conversation, and and I think that the world needs to know more about the kind of uh, of, of incredibly deep and knowledgeable uh, things that that your team is doing over there in terms of uh, memory management. You know, I came with some preconceived ideas at. Uh, I mean, I'm switching topics, but I came with some preconceived ideas to the coffee area, and then uh, I was like, "Wait, well, I think we should do this and this and this." And then Patrick sued immediately. He's like, "Ah, well, the reason with this is this and that, and we measured this." And like, oh. he knows his uh, he knows he knows his business. Yeah, and uh, I I totally agree with that. It happens to me all the time. I have some pre preconceived ideas, and then I I speak with the engineers, and I go. Oh, okay. That's why. That makes a little sense. That's great. <laughs> yeah. Happens all the time. And the same for Mayoni. I mean, uh, um, I don't think that people realize just how sophisticated and advanced .NET's garbage collector sister is, and just how much thought and love goes into making that, uh, uh, you know, a great uh, server side and desktop side uh, garbage collector. So, anyways, you should have Mayoni here, and I think uh, Rich just joined us. Let's yeah, and, uh, I I want to apologize actually. So Rich has some email issues currently, and I sent the Hangout URL by email, and of course he didn't receive it. <laughs> and then uh, he was he was uh, uh, screaming, "Who will invite me everywhere he could?" And uh, finally, I saw him. <laughs> uh, yeah, so. <laughs> I Sorry am the, the one person at Microsoft who apparently can't receive email anymore. It's been a week and a half that my email's been broken, but no one else's is, so it's oh. weird. 
Yeah, email uh, is complicated, apparently. We have this saying in France that uh, shoemakers are always have the worst shoes. <laughs> yeah. Uh, anyway, I was listening to the conversation on um, the YouTube side of the Hangout. Uh, sounds good so far. Uh, it was very nice to see you um, last week, um, Miguel, you and your team. Oh, the pleasure was all ours, Richard. Um, uh, obviously, we'll have to meet again soon and kind of get to the next level of planning and also start to um, publish some of the results of our um, conversations. Um, I, mean, I think we can kind of talk about at least one of them, which was uh, which you've kind of already talked about a little bit, which is the expansion of the API surface area. That's right. Um, well, we already covered it, but essentially, uh, yeah. I mean, essentially, the idea is to make existing .NET developers be able to move very, very easily to the .NET Core uh, workload. Um, right, and and it's not just. I mean, I would I would phrase it a tiny bit differently. It's just between workloads. .NET Core should not be special. That's right. Yes, 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 yes. yes. I think the only thing that would be special is you would be running without some of the Windows APIs, right? Yes, but um, that would be similar to if you had gone, if you moved your code to any cross-platform implementation. That's right, exactly. Yeah, so .NET Core will be, you want it to be exactly like Xamarin in that, in that respect. Yeah. So. Uh, Trim is asking, how do you think Mono and .NET Core will converge? Uh, well, there, uh, there's already some convergence uh, <clears throat> on uh, that area. So the, the low-hanging fruit for, for Mono has been essentially to uh, take the open source reference source implementation. And what we do is we take, uh, we take that stuff and we replace all of the old uh, Mono code. So what we've been doing is mostly porting uh, the pieces that were unportable or adjusting them to Mono. Um, so that it runs with a separate runtime. <clears throat> so it's uh, depending on how you count, uh, in which assemblies you count and how you do it, Mono already has replaced about between 40 and 60 percent, depending on how you count again, uh, the, its, its existing code with uh, reference source code. So there's already a huge convergence from that perspective. And you get uh, bug fixes, you get better memory usage, you get better performance. Um, you get better compatibility. So that's the first piece. <clears throat> then uh, the, the other piece is really whether we can share technology on, on the more sophisticated pieces, things like, uh, like code generators and uh, garbage collectors and things like that. And, uh, and while we've taken a few pieces, some very interesting and complicated pieces from .NET, uh, from .NET like the thread pool, um, I think that one of the, the next the targets for us is, uh, is uh, reusing the garbage collector. So we're on the early phases of, of researching that piece now. Cool. Uh, and then the other piece of, I guess, sharing and convergence you might see going the other direction is, um, which we already discussed, is .NET Core adopting the mono surface area. Right, which we copied from you guys. Still, still, still. Yeah, uh, I know, I know. <laughs> yeah. That's all good. Yeah, hopefully we'll share uh, a lot more code uh, going forward. I mean, one thing that we've been doing at Xamarin is uh, uh, because our story has always been one of cross-platform between Android and iOS and desktop, uh, a lot of the work that we put into doesn't necessarily go into the runtime itself. It goes into 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 packages, right, into Nuges. So uh, a lot of the work that we do goes there. Doesn't really. It's not really the runtime. It, I mean. We certainly want to share more in the runtime, but what we want to do is, is push this vision forward of, of cross-platform.net. So, um, so whenever we put out a package, we try to make this uh, nuget, uh, this nuget with, uh, with libraries uh, run on all platforms, right? So for example, let me, get, let me, let me, sh uh, let me tell you about uh, Skia, right? Skia is a nice 2D graphics library, and when you install Skia Sharp, you now get it on Android, iOS, UWP, uh, Win32, and we're working with the NuGet team on how to make it easy uh, uh, to also deploy on Linux, right? Because on Linux, every Linux is different. So I think that the way that you have to think about this is that uh, 
we and, and the reason why this is a good example before I get there, the reason why this is a good example is that on each platform you need to do things a little bit different with Skia, right? So you surface one API to the world, but behind the scenes you're using different implementations of different pieces, right? Um, so a lot of the work that we do is along those lines, giving you a single API that runs across the board and and takes advantage of each platform specific features. And you see the same with Xamarin Forms, right? It's a UI toolkit, unified API, multiple platforms. Um, so that's a way that uh, that I think people should be thinking about. The runtime, there's things and innovation that will continue to happen uh, uh, in the core of .NET, but there's just so much opportunity in the higher levels, right? Uh, things that you can do with Azure or things that you can do with Service Fabric and all these things. Cool. Uh, Giovanni is asking, if I want to write a, cr a cross-platform desktop app, is Mono GTK Sharp still the way to go? What's the future mm. there? That's an excellent question. Yes. Well, what, can you repeat that question? Uh, if I want to write a cross-platform desktop application, is Mono GTK Sharp still the way to go? And what is the future there? So yeah, we have ideas about that, don't we? <laughs> well, we have ideas. Uh, well, we use GTK, I mean, ourselves, uh, Xamarin, we continue to use GTK to a large extent because of historical needs, right? And that's what uh, um, Xamarin Studio is built with, right? Uh, parts of it, large parts, parts of it. Of it yeah. with that. And the problem is, yes, if you want to write ones run anywhere, that's today the, the out-of-the-box solution that works across the board. Uh, now, we're now trying to follow our own guidance, right, uh, which is you really want to uh, let the native platform shine. So we're restructuring our own IDE as time goes by in the same way that we're telling our mobile developers to do it for their apps, which, which is you have some shared, uh, some shared code that is independent of the UI, and you can structure it in many ways, right? You can use uh, partial classes, or you can use... Uh, uh, MVC patterns or MVVM patterns. So you get to pick one of these patterns uh, or, or idioms uh, to build your application, and then you, you design platform-specific code. So you still get to share a lot of code, but then you get to have spe special versions of your UI that will leverage uh, the best bits of, of every platform. So it really depends just how much uh, time you want to put into this. I mean, GTK will give you right ones run anywhere, but then it's going to look a little bit odd, right? There's, you're going to see dialog boxes that look just a little bit funky or <coughs> on Windows or on Mac, and you won't get access to core animation. You, go, you won't get access to core image hardware accelerated filters. Um, so so my, my recommendation, and it depends. If you're building a consumer app that needs to have a tremendous amount of polish is to structure your app in such a way that you have multiple UI implementations. Use GTK for Linux. Uh, use uh, uh, Xamarin Mac for Mac OS, which is now free and open source. And uh, use WPF uh, or, uh, or WinRT on, uh, or UWP on Windows, right? So that's what I would do. So that's if you if you really need uh, a native experience on each uh, system. But some people might actually uh, not have the time to do that and might uh, right. want so, to get a. Yeah. So today the short term version is GTK Sharp is probably the best that you're gonna get. Uh, but the vision, and I think this is where where we both have ideas, right? The vision is can we extend Xamarin Forms, which is also now open source, and add a Mac backend to the equation, because that's really the last backend missing. There's a WPF backend uh, almost complete. Um, we could do a WinForms backend as well if we wanted to, but uh, but that would uh, generally be right once run anywhere, and it would look a it would look more native, right? It would look more native, except uh, you would be limited to the intersection of APIs. Yeah, and, and uh, to be clear to uh, the, the person who asked the question, um, uh, Giovanni. Um, we, are, we are basically exploring ideas right now, but 
But right. There's nothing to announce. Uh, it's just something that we're thinking about. Right, right, right. But anyways, there's a repo. I mean, if you if you want to help uh, and you go to my GitHub repo, you can see my uh, my initial attempt at adding a Mac backend. Where did I put that thing? Um, I, yeah. I don't know where to paste this thing, but oh, there it is. Yeah, you can see the beginning of a Mac backend there uh, in one of the branches. Oh, OK. Uh, we all put that link into the description as well. Thank you. <laughs> uh, looks like Daniel is responding on um, chat. Uh, he's, he's voting. <laughs> yeah, so Daniel is saying plus one to Xamarin Forms for cross-platform native UIs, minus one to HTML for native UIs. Uh, you know, uh, yeah, I mean, I, also, I don't mind HTML. It's just uh, there's a place for HTML. Um, like, for example, I really like the ability of embedding an HTML view and then running things like D3 or uh, all of these cute renders that you can put inside HTML or even do very nice text rendering. So I love doing that. I don't think that UI toolkits are remotely good in that, uh, from that perspective. Um, but, for, but for native platform gadgetry, it's very difficult to make HTML behave properly. So if you're going to have dialog boxes and user interface elements and these things. I'd rather write all of that shell with the native code and then put some, uh, you know, spice it up with some HTML, some great HTML views inside that. Mm -hmm. And there yeah. is also a category of applications that uh, actually need to run both on the web and uh, in a desktop form. And it's, uh, it's also a way to uh, gain some time there. Right. Yeah, I've actually been using the um, Amazon Music app um, for music listening, unsurprisingly. Mm -hmm. uh, and I discovered it was an Electron app. And I've actually been surprisingly happy with it. It provides a very similar experience on Mac and Windows. It's mm -hmm. fairly immersive in nature. Like it's got a black background and um, co colors that contrast a lot on top of the, the black. And uh, I've been enjoying using it. What is, the, what, is, what is this one? Amazon? Uh... Music. Amazon Music, okay. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm doing my, my part to plug the other company across the water. What? Uh, You're not using Groove? <laughs> I actually, I have a subscription to that, too. <laughs> um, uh, for the, those of you that don't know, um, uh, Amazon is, is in Seattle, and so we sometimes refer to them as the company across the water because there's a big lake in between us, as if we were the only two companies. There uh, is not <laughs> just a lake between us. <laughs> What's that? There is not just a lake between us. Well, there no, there's the lake some us. buildings. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I like Amazon. I like what they do. Yeah. Well, uh, I'm an Apple Music also, guy, but I, I respect your, your choices, guys. So we have the whole gamut. Yeah. That's funny. I'm a Google Music person. <laughs> oh, there you go. Thank you, Stacy. Uh, oh, Spotify. I see. I see how it goes. I see uh, how. It goes. I hope I'm not too. Uh, I'm not pronouncing this too bad, too badly. Uh, is asking will Xamarin iOS and Xamarin Android move to .NET Core? Xamarin iOS and Xamarin Android. Uh, well. I mean, uh, I mean, they could if .NET Core run on Android and iOS. Um, so yeah, yeah. The way I kind of see that is um, that's not an option. So .NET team owns .NET Core. Miguel's team owns um, Xamarin iOS and Xamarin Android. There's nothing that he can use uh, today that we produce on those operating systems. The point that we do the work to enable that, then he would have that choice, and he could do various tests, you know, performance, reliability, whatever, to make that decision. But right now, there's no decision to make because those don't, those um, implementations. Um, also, like we already discussed a couple times already, the API surface area that we expose isn't isn't quite enough. And so we would absolutely have to um, um, provide a bunch more APIs for that to even be a conversation. Yeah. So 
it, it's it's kind yeah. of a non conversation at the moment. Right, and and it could be attempted. Uh, you know, once the API surface is there, one easy way to prototype it is with Xamarin Mac because that's essentially a supported platform. So that one uh, that one definitely would work uh, as as soon as some of the APIs are 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 in place. Um, so I mean that could happen, but yeah, the other platforms are are a lot tougher right now. Yeah, I guess the other thing I'd say is, um, uh, and I think this is actually has been true for a number of years um, before the acquisition, but um, I feel like the kind of methodology that we've been using is you know we've got a thousand units of engineering time across our two teams, and we've got um, this customer value that we know we need to go build in order to have a compelling product and to make customers happy. Across our two teams with these 1,000 shared units, how are we going to do that? And starting with replacing runtime technology is typically not um, right. high on the list of um, providing that compelling value. Now, I mean, I think the thing you said at the start is true, that you know Microsoft has some good stuff that could be useful for, for those... Um, for the workloads that you um, provide to, to our shared customers, but I I still don't think that is where we typically start. Uh, we usually start higher level in the stack on customer value that we want to provide. Is That's that right. fair? Yeah, and also, I mean, we have uh, such a bright future ahead of us in terms of the things that we both want to do in terms of libraries, uh, in terms of language design, IDE experiences, cloud, I mean, uh, we uh, we're both working very hard to to improve uh, the tooling for Azure and uh, making Azure a fantastic platform. So there's just so much other stuff uh, that comes into mind that uh, we're all thinking about. You know, improving NuGet, the build experience, uh, improving build times. Uh, you know, making sure giving you these interactive experiences like workbooks. Uh, you know, live documentation. There's so much other stuff that we're doing that this is like revisiting the same battle for the same uh, for the sake of revisiting. Um, so, uh, like Rich says, we have a thousand units, and there's a long list of of great things that we can do, and we we'll probably would be spending those thousand units into into you know in, into exploring uh, great new areas and and make a bunch of people happier. Yeah. Uh, Trim is asking, in a conference during build, you said that the love from C Sharp has moved to F Sharp, and uh, is there just a developer love towards it, or is it because of performance? Oh, no, it's, uh, you know, it's uh, languages. This is like saying, what is your favorite uh, favorite dish, right? It really depends on who you ask, and uh, and also it depends on, on, on your mood, right? So, for example, today I, w I felt like uh, I wanted to have a, uh, I wanted to have a, a, a delicious uh, meatball sandwich, uh, but tomorrow I might want to choose something else. So I think that at the time I made that comment, I was feeling F Sharpie that morning. Um, uh, but you know, a lot of our developers do enjoy F Sharp. Uh, they love F Sharp passionately, and uh, and they really enjoy it. And some of them love F Sharp, uh, C Sharp the same way. So um, I, I didn't want to say that uh, that it was more over the other, really. Because like for example, right now I've been hacking. Non-stop on C sharp, uh, and I haven't touched F sharp for a couple of weeks. So, uh, anyways, we love so them. I, both. I have a different question that I, you and I have talked about this a little bit, but I think it's an interesting public discussion, which is, um, what do we have to do to get either Mono or .NET Core? Uh, doesn't really matter which or both. Uh, adopted by Linux distros. Uh, is there anything about the more, most recent changes? Uh, yeah, well, yeah, I think, yeah, I think that's a great question. And and the uh, and the good news is that essentially, Rich has driven a lot of these changes, organizational changes inside the company, and also that Microsoft as a whole has embraced the changes that are needed. So um, one of the big distribution channels for for Unix is uh, well, one of the major requirements to be included in a Linux distribution is that the software is open source. And uh, and there's a little bit of nuance there that some people miss, but it, it requires it requires essentially that you do not put um, restrictions that would prevent redistribution and modification. 
So now that .NET is open source, um, it you know to a large extent all of uh, you know all of its requirements are ready to go. But there's some pieces of the SDK. This is the thing that we're discussing recently uh, that includes PCL contracts um, that need to also be open source. So right now they're distributed under this idea that this is a contract, an immutable contract, and we're going to have to lift that restriction. Um, and once that restriction is lifted, then the PCL contracts can become available everywhere. Now, this is kind of a minor point because, in general, .NET Core, as it ships today from, uh, from the download side, is already uh, suitable to be distributed. It's just this little piece of the SDK that, uh, is that what you were referring to, Rich? Well, that's certainly one thing I had in my mind. I, I thought it was interesting to hear if you had anything else to add. Um, well, I mean, uh, just the background. And the background is that uh, for software to be included in the mainline distributions, right, Debian, which is the parent distribution for Ubuntu, or, or Fedora, which is the parent distribution for Red Hat, uh, the software has to have this, uh, it needs to abide by the open source uh, uh, definition. And uh, and now that .NET is in that position, it can now be included upstream and distributed everywhere. Uh, for the Linux distributions, it was also it also became sort of a politically charged thing, the patent discussion. And uh, and the good news is that .NET includes a very strong patent statement, uh, and uh, and Microsoft has also offered that now for Mono, uh, where they say yes, you can use this, and we're not going to sue you, we're not going to take you to court over using this technology. Uh, there are no submarine patents in there for you. So it's um, so I think that that really removes all the hurdles and all the legal ambiguity uh, that there could have been over .NET. So now we're just waiting for 1.0. Right. So you think if we yeah, do 1.0, make this extremely small, a little bit off to the side SDK change, that um, it should be a, a bright future with right. respect to uh, .NET being something that we can, um, yeah, you can say .NET and Linux distributions in the same sentence. Yeah. Now, what I want, and that's the first step. Now, what I would love to is to get to the next stage, which is we should make it the default, right? There was a time where Mono was the default uh, on the installation media for Ubuntu. And the way that you drive the, the, the default in installation media is you build great apps that people want on top of the platform, right? So I think our next mission, right, now that we're shipping .NET is, let's put some great apps. Uh, let's put our best work out. I mean, I know Bertrand worked for many years on, on, on web technologies and, uh, and uh, on Orchard, but just along those lines, there's great .NET technologies that now we can put on Linux. Let's package them up, and let's make them useful for a lot of people. Uh, I've been talking to, to Scott Hunter, uh, who is uh, 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 I think that he leads the .NET PM team at Microsoft. About I think he does too. I think he does. I think he does. He might. You might work for him. All three of us do. <laughs> okay, and uh, and uh, he's very receptive to the idea of uh, of you know we have some bold ideas of things that we want to promote uh, using .NET Core. Uh, so I think that we're gonna we're gonna get a couple of these great apps. We're gonna build a few others that we think are also gonna be great applications, and, and we think that people in general would love them. Um, and the other thing that I think is also very attractive about .NET is that uh, we're moving towards a world where it is a little bit like Go. You're able to package a self-contained version of the application and distribute it, right? Uh, which a lot of people like. So, so we're going to get there, and, uh, and hopefully we can make the .NET SDK you know, part of the, uh, of the default install media uh, that people get. Awesome. So, so of course, Sebastian Ross in the chat is saying, Orchard, yeah, let's make .NET great again by working on Orchard. Oh, yes, <laughs> yes. Well, that's one of them. I don't want to disclose my secret, because these are good ideas. These are good ideas. But uh, we, have yeah. a, we have a couple of good ideas of, 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 of nice surprises for people uh, built on top of .NET Core. Yeah, yeah, Miguel is definitely one of those, let's make .NET great again kind of guys. Oh, I don't like that. Uh, <laughs> no, I'm not one of those. .NET has always been great. We just need to uh, we just need to tell the world about it. Um, you know I'm teasing you. I know, I know, I know. 
Uh, our friend JB is asking, uh, with the reference source and .NET Core, we are seeing .NET code that Mono and Xamarin can reuse. Are we going to see tools and libraries from the Mono ecosystem go the opposite way and be used by .NET? Well, I think so. Like I said, I think that a lot of the innovation now happens outside of the core framework. And I think that that is not only something that happens with Mono or .NET themselves, right? But it happens in the Ruby world, in the Node world, in the Python world, right? In the past, people really wanted to get their bits shoved into the framework, and, and that became the distribution model. But now, it's so much easier in this world to publish new JS and publish uh, you know, Node packages that, uh, that uh, I mean, I would love if .NET wants to take some of my code. Uh, I would be very happy. In particular, let me post this, getline.cs. That's my favorite piece of code. It's tiny, self-contained file, uh, useful everywhere. But in general, uh, this stuff is available as a package that you can install and add to your project. And the amount of innovation that happens there is just tremendous. Yeah, so what what's likely to happen is that there won't be a difference, right? There won't, there won't be a mono ecosystem and a dot net ecosystem. Right. It would just be a you know it would just be a dot net ecosystem and, and the code runs on both. Uh, there, I always like this. Uh, we have this guy in the company. Uh, just in fact, he's sitting right on top of me. Uh, <laughs> who? Uh, who? God is working for you. <laughs> no, 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 no. Jeff Steadfast. He's he's almost as good. Um, and. He has a thing for email, right? He, he built our previous email client a decade ago, and he knows everything that goes wrong with email. Oh, and I know this guy. Yeah, and everything that people get wrong with email sending or encoding or messaging. And he's also a little bit of a performance uh, uh, aficionado. So he built and implemented what I consider the only reliable email library in the world. Um, I mean, perhaps Google has one, and maybe the Outlook team has one internally. But um, in terms of performance and in terms of compatibility and features, I don't think anything comes close to the libraries that he wrote. Uh, they're called MailKit and MindKit, and you can get it as nuggets, right? So there's no need to put those into the frameworks. Uh, people can just. They were, they were some of the first libraries to be available for .NET Core RC1. And they were there before the, the system mail uh, stuff. And, and they're beautiful because they, they support a streaming API. So with email, what happens is that uh, a lot of people implement these things, but they implement them to run on the loaded data, right? And an email can get very large. And in particular, mine makes things very complicated because you can have uh, email messages within email messages within compressed streams, right? So uh, if you don't do this carefully, you, you just end up with a bloated pig. And what MindKit and MailKit do is they give you email the way that, uh, you know, the most efficient and possible way that you can. And I don't think that there's any anything in the world on any other language that handles it like that. So uh, back to the question, I think that what we're going to do is we're going to keep contributing to these shared repositories of, of IL code. Uh, and then you get to pick it as a nougat. And I think that's the place that, would, that, that the mechanism that will give us the most agility uh, to deliver new features to users. Actually, I want to ask uh, JB what, what exactly he had in mind, what libraries he had in mind oh, when he asked the question. He might be thinking about Cecil or Cecil. Oh, is that JB? JB? Microsoft JB? Yeah, that one. Yeah. Oh, Microsoft JB. So what was the question again? <laughs> well, it's the one that you just answered about. Uh, and the mono ecosystem uh, uh, library is from the mono ecosystem migrating or, or? Uh, I just can't. I mean, I, I would have to think about one of those. Um, you know, all there's all kinds of, of little those. things that we can share, like all of our patches to reference sources. You know, you guys can have them as you expand the API of .NET Core. We already did the work, so you might as well just cop copy paste that stuff. Yeah, no. we should. Um, Actually, we've never we've never discussed that before. Yeah, we should do that. Well, yeah, we should figure out a way to um, to do that in a public way. Um, yeah, let's let's discuss that. Yes. I, we haven't and discussed I, it before. The other thing that we were talking, uh, Rich and myself, uh, about this, we want to 
given the geographical difference, right, the .NET team has historically all been in in a, in, in a floor, right? You guys have all been in a floor or two floors? Mostly one, but yes. Yeah, exactly. So uh, the .NET team has historically uh, driven a lot of their conversation at the coffee machine, like we do over here. But now that the .NET world is much wider, uh, and it goes beyond us, it reaches Red Hat, it reaches Unity, uh, and and we are, you know, 5,000 kilometers, is it 5,000, 6,000, something like that, away from uh, Redmond, what we're discussing is we need to take a lot of our internal discussions to the public. And we started to do that on, on chat rooms, and we're starting to do that on, on Gitter for uh, for a lot of the .NET code, but, but we should do that also with mailing lists and uh, things like that. Yep. Uh, Daniel is saying something interesting here. Would love to see some .NET Micro Framework. Love. .NET Micro Framework. Do you have anything to say about that? <laughs> I, I, to be honest, I've, I've built a Micro Framework app once, it's, and I said this is neat, and that was it. I think that Micro Framework is so small that uh, you know, if you if you spend an afternoon giving love to that, that micro framework, you run out of uh, memory. <laughs> yeah. So um, I do actually have a, a few things, to, well, a few opinions about about this, having done a lot of uh, IoT things in yeah. my uh, recent past. Uh, personally, for my own projects, I now I now prefer to target um, some uh, Linux boards. Uh, rather than smaller, uh, less powerful boards, because they are so cheap that it's not just not worth uh, passing. But in some cases, I mean, de it depends what you're doing. If you're uh, if you're working on a design that must be industrialized and so on, you, you have other concerns entering the, the problems. But personally, I don't see that much uh, uh, use for for micro framework anymore, and I, I prefer to target mono or the, the full framework. Uh, Shmuel is actually <laughs> saying something really funny. I need micro framework for my agent watch. Well, if only that existed. Yeah, I mean, there might be some use cases, but uh, they're tiny. I mean, even the new watches, the Android watches, they have half a, a gigabyte of memory on the on that beast, right? Uh, the Apple Watch, what, what's that thing? Apple Watch Wiki. Yeah, I mean, it's a it's a it's really a discussion of, um, so micro framework is clearly targeted, as you guys have kind of said, at a particular um, hardware profile. Yeah. Right? And the question is, is what are the type of, um, um, Applications, not not software applications, but applications in a more general sense, where you would use something that small. So, um, you know, in the old days, it was if you had a thermostat on the wall, it was clear that it would be more of a .NET micro framework thing. I think we're moving to a world where the mic the thermostat on the wall is actually running, you know, embedded Linux or embedded Windows or something with a 32-bit chip. That is actually capable of a significant amount of computation, and even even now, the washing machine and the dishwasher are transitioning to 32-bit chips as well, and so it's just a question of what that that space looks like. It's 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 definitely a it's becoming more scoped, I guess, is the point. Yeah, and systems on the chip change everything, and uh, but there is still a place for smaller boards, such as absolutely, the, you know, it's still hugely popular. But uh, yeah, yeah. Um. Um, I wanted to ask about the future of workbooks. Yes, I'm. Uh, I love workbooks. So anything you want to know. <laughs> uh, I, I think one question that is on everybody's mind is: uh, Would it be possible to use this something like this on the web for documentation, for interactive documentation? Yes, it's on the roadmap. Yeah. The um, anyone uh, asked you for that before? Yeah, no, nobody had thought of that before. Yeah, it's it's odd. It's odd. Uh, no, we have. Uh, yeah, right now we have. Uh, uh, you know, we go back to the discussion of we have a thousand units of work and. And uh, you know a thousand units of engineering uh, heads, and then 
how do you split it up, right? So workbooks, uh, like the workbooks is an area where we really want to invest, right? So uh, we're going to spend more time doing things there. And just like the web uh, thing, we have such a long list of things that people want to put on workbooks that uh, we just got to prioritize. And they'll all come in due time. Um, I think the current sprint is aimed at uh, wrapping up a few concepts that we haven't quite finished, which is the um, uh, wrapping up. Right now, they're really not workbooks. They're really work pages, right? So we haven't really finalized the workbook piece. Uh, and workbooks, really, the idea is that we want to distribute them either as a page or as a collection of pages, right? So you you might have some code behind in there. Uh, you might want to have some images, right? So you can actually produce books with this. Um, and you want to be able to hyperlink from one to another. So that's the, that's the current one that we're doing. Uh, and uh, there's a lot of tiny little of buglets and error message improvements, you know, a lot of paper cuts that people are running into. So I would say that is the, the first thing that we have on the pipeline. Um, the second thing that would come after that one would be uh, we're spending uh, some time on the inspector side of the house. One thing that people haven't noticed about workbooks is that there's two tabs on top. And the second tab actually gives you uh, uh, it, it gives you a rich uh, explorer for your data into your running application. And it works, but we, we have been accumulating a lot of feature requests and, and polish that we just haven't had the time to, uh, time to do. So we're going to do that. And I think that after that, we'll look into the, into, you know, a little bit down the line, we'll look into, into, the, uh, into editing on the web. Um, you know. And there's a couple of other small things for the first duration. Uh, like, for example, we really need to have an export to HTML option so that you can take an, a computation and export it as a static HTML as a, instead of a, of, a, of, a, of a live workbook so you can host your documentation. So that is coming in this print as well. Um, you know, uh, lots of tiny little things like that, more agents. Uh, so we'll, we'll get to the web one. Uh, it's just... Uh, we first want to tie up a few loose ends. Um, the workbooks actually might be a good example of um, where Microsoft is, uh, the, the, I guess the old non xamarin Microsoft, you know what I'm trying to say, mm -hmm. is likely to, to adopt your tech. Like, uh, uh, right. I think you've, you've received a lot of interest. Uh, so I know on the .NET team, we plan to adopt workbooks um, quite significantly. I think it's great, uh, great user experience. I think... Um, we share the vision that you have for it, and um, yeah, I'd like to see the .NET document pivot pretty hard to workbooks. And I have to say, for our brothers in spirit at Microsoft, that uh, if you want to get access, sisters, but yes. The what? Oh, brothers and sorry, sorry, sorry. <laughs> brothers and like, sisters. wait a minute. <laughs> brothers and sisters at Microsoft. If you want access to the repo, uh, drop me an email, and we'll hook you up. Okay. Uh, so you can, because what I was sharing is just what my team is doing, right? But you can always submit a pull request, and uh, we'll take it from there. Uh, uh, totally. So you know, people want visualizers and more things. We'll put it in. We'll put them all in. Uh, Trim is asking, uh, do you think that at some point .NET Core or Mono will become as powerful to switch from making WPF to W? to UWP, Xamarin Forms, cross-platform? I'm not sure I understand the question, actually. Um, I think the answer is always yes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't understand the question. Maybe it needs to be. No. Uh, right. Trim, if you want to, uh, to restate your question, uh, please do so. Um, I think maybe what the question is, is like um, if you start from the notion that WPF and .NET Framework on the Windows desktop is very powerful, and you, you continue, then you go to the notion that UWP is less powerful than WPF, um, is there... Yeah, actually, this isn't going anywhere useful. I don't know what the question is. <laughs> OK. Yeah. It's a good attempt. Um. Uh, 
Okay. Anything else? <laughs> We're almost out of time. Uh, we have um, about four minutes. Anything else you want to talk about? Well, we have um, a very small. Uh, this is, has nothing to do with Miguel in particular, but we um, um, have a small PSA to make that we could okay, no, say it's right fine. now. That I will actually pass off to Stacy. Hmm? Um, we uh, <laughs> we broke something this week. Um, oh, I think yeah. Now would be a good time to uh, explain the thing that broke and what we've done to fix it and what our plans are for the future. Right, right. So what broke is uh, the ability to use um, VS Code with Unity um, on a Linux or Mac. And um, the reason that broke, that only broke for some scenarios. So we released a new extension to the C Sharp plugin for it, um, and that or released an update to that extension. And that update broke um, existing people if you happen to upgrade. So if you're uh, somebody, not just Unity, but uh, Xamarin as well, if you happen to be uh, somebody building Mono Technologies that was using the old, uh, I think it was like formerly known as the built-in Omni Sharp plugin, uh, just don't upgrade to uh, the latest C Sharp extension. Um, if you stay on the one that you have, you'll be okay for the time being. Um, if you happen to be a, a Windows user, you should actually be okay with upgrading. So um, we've gone through and we've just updated the documentation to create awareness around this, and then we're working internally to put together plans to get a fix out so that you can upgrade that extension. So, so when, when, is, yeah. when are you saying the fix is coming? Um, I think Richard, we're targeting an RTM, right? Um, uh, no? Oh, no, I guess you can't um, paste web addresses into... Uh, if, you have, if you have URLs to give, uh, send them to uh, me. Uh, uh, I don't know if you were eyeing me. <laughs> no, as, uh, I'll just pass the URL to Bertrand um, to the help page. Yeah, we don't, we don't, we haven't locked our plan yet, but we yeah. definitely want to get everything fixed by .NET Core RTM, which is the end of June. Uh, we definitely have some folks working on fixing this scenario. We care deeply about it. We've reported it to Unity. Mm -hmm. uh, we're effectively reporting it to Miguel right now. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, because uh, it did yeah. break some um, some uh, mono. There are some people who are using VS Code to edit various mono-based projects as well. I don't know if you know that. No, I'm sorry, what was that? There are people that are using VS Code to edit C Sharp for mono-based projects, in, separate from Unity. Nice, yes, uh, yeah, we know. I mean, yeah, VS Code is incredibly popular. Uh, the fact we just saw, not only that, but a guy uh, in our community ported Xamarin Android to Linux because we've never really supported it. And he is like, I said, oh, well, that's great. Let me, I guess we need to ship the IDE support. He's like, ah, I don't care. I got VS Code. So he sent a screenshot of his language. He has his own language called Gulen. And uh, he has his own language working in VS Code, compiling for Android. <laughs> uh, yeah, pretty popular editor. Yeah so, yeah, so the change probably broke him as well. Um, so temporary replacement. So no one should be left out completely in the lurch. Um, All right, fair enough, fair so, enough. Um, yeah, so this, this is, yep, we broke it by accident, and we're trying to do the right thing. Yep, and we're trying to make sure we don't do it again. Yeah. Oops. Uh, we'll, we'll put the link, we'll put, Bertram will post the link to the Unity page, and that, that should be pretty much useful for everyone. Mm-hmm. Ah, uh, the life of engineering. Yeah. So again, kind of the key takeaway is is if you're using the old built-in Omni Sharp and you're on a Mac or Linux, don't don't upgrade to the C Sharp plugin just yet. Uh, if you're doing mono related development. Let me see. Would this prompt me to upgrade? Let me see. It shouldn't. No, I'm not prompting. So it probably still works for me. Yeah. It it doesn't prompt, which is um, that's a good thing. Now, if I click check for updates, all right, let's quit just in case. I don't want to break my system. All right. 
<laughs> okay. Oh, and that's actually all the time we had today. Unless you have some uh, final words of wisdom, uh, maybe a, a Mexican proverb that you. Oh, I don't have a Mexican proverb. I've been. Uh, my mind is distracted. I'm learning. Uh, I'm playing with Azure Functions. Uh, that's what I've been doing for the last couple of days. Uh, so I've been having a lot of fun with that. I'm trying to build a. Uh, you know, I've had this thing for many years. I I have trust issues. I have trust issues, and uh, and I also don't like to run. Uh, you know, I don't want to run code on my server. I don't want to have to protect my server. I don't want to secure my server. And uh, so for years, I've avoided uh, on my blog adding comments for that reason. Uh, and uh, so so I'm I'm giving it a shot. I'm trying to do my own comment system purely with Azure Functions. Interesting. Uh, yeah, I know it's a solved problem, but that's you know it's it's one of these things you obsess over and uh, and uh, you can't get out of it. So I like the idea of uh, of paying pennies on uh, on the function and uh, so anyways that's what I'm doing. Interesting. Cool. Sounds good. <laughs> okay, right. I'll, I'll talk with you uh, again on the show in um, some number of months. We'll 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 treat you as a recurring guest of sorts, which I hope is okay. But we should also we should bring Mayoni. Uh, Mayoni is amazing. Yeah. Okay. If you wanna, we, if we bring Mayoni on, if you wanna lurk on the show, we would totally be good with that. I would do that absolutely. Okay, then I think you just signed up for it. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> people need to know just how amazing the .NET GC is, and also just the kind of work that she does to keep that GC and, and teach people. She has this whole teaching thing about GCs. Internally at Microsoft, that uh, that people need to know because it's a, uh, it is the most sophisticated things I've ever seen. Totally. Thanks, Miguel. All right, thank you guys. Thanks. Thank you guys. Thanks Bye -bye. everyone. Uh, I want to thank the audience for the great questions, and uh, we'll see uh, you lovely people next week. Bye everyone. Goodbye. Bye guys. Bye.